According to a recent USA Today article, 19 states have enacted laws to crack down on people who pass off their pets as service animals. I recently sat down with Senator David Osmick to talk about some possible new statutes in Minnesota, and I began by asking him if there is confusion about the difference between service animals and emotional support animals. I think there is, and I think there's also abuse going on in the system. I think people are claiming either claiming a disability that they don't even don't really have they're overblowing a disability or they're out outwardly circ trying to circumvent parts of airlines and that you have to check your dog and, and and follow certain rules and they're trying to circumvent them and it's because we have become much more of a pet society i guess uh, but i think we really need to be careful on what we call a service dog and or service animal versus a convenience animal or your pet because these service animals are very highly trained and when you bring into an environment particularly in, a, you know, in an aircraft a pet or a pet that is not trained it can do a lot of damage to that service animal that they have spent months or even years developing so uh, I think it's worth uh, starting that discussion and that's why I'm starting to review what we have on the books and what is happening in other states, particularly in Virginia. I think it's important to note that the Americans with Disabilities Act distinguishes between service animals which are protected and can go in public places. It's the animal, which is either a dog or in some cases a miniature horse, is considered an extension of the person with the disability. These are federally protected. These animals, as you said, undergo significant training. Uh, examples are seeing eye dog or a hearing dog or a dog that helps someone with a seizure. Does, is, is education part of, of the mix here in terms of people understanding what a service dog truly is versus an emotional support kind of animal? Uh, yes, I think there is a, an educational component to it, uh, but I think also I think there is a component uh, beyond that that people are trying to take advantage of a situation. Um, you know, we have, I've heard stories already about people who move into a new apartment and the apartment says, no dogs allowed and everybody in the apartment building likes it that way because some, they may have allergies that they like the fact that there's no animals or no pets uh, and then a couple weeks after the person gets in there they suddenly come up with an excuse note from a doctor saying well, I have to have this pet for whatever reason it's not necessarily a person who may have a serious or, or an ADA type of situation but they circumvent the whole process uh, and then all the people in that building are now subject to this. And how fair is it to the people that live in the building? So we're going to have to find a balance here or maybe some more educational means. And, and in some cases, it may have to be turning, turned into punishment when we find people who are misrepresenting or abusing the system. In researching this segment, I read a number of news stories where citizens go online to purchase vests for their pet to make it look like a service animal. The Daily Beast reported that there's now a cottage industry of websites that for a price, you can buy service animal ID cards, certificates, and patches. Is this part of the problem, the availability of these sort of false service animal things? I absolutely agree. I think the more you can, uh, the more of that abuse that goes on, it not only diminishes the service dogs, because when, it, when you have a service dog, that is something that's very important to you, but it also creates, like you said, these cottage industries that could falsely represent what really a service dog is. So uh, I, I don't know if it's more of a federal issue where we have to have some type of a common ID that says this is a service dog. Uh, I have any, I, I'm gonna be speaking with the folks that train these dogs to find out what type of, not only the, more about the training that service animals have, but also about what do they have for identification so that they can show, you know, what, do they have a card that specifically says, I, I don't know a lot about the subject matter, but I'm gonna learn more about it as we go. But I wanna make sure that we do the right thing in Minnesota and find out what, if this is a problem, and if so, how to deal with it. Both, as you mentioned, Virginia passed a law, Colorado also passed a law uh, that imposes fines for people who pass off their pet as a service animal. In terms of businesses, the ADA only allows two questions that mm -hmm. can be asked to a person. What task does your animal perform? And uh, is this animal required because of a disability? So service dogs actually don't have ID. So maybe, as you said, there should be a national ID, but won't any kind of law be difficult to enforce? Um, that's the part of the challenge of this legislation. If we're going to go down this path, first we have to identify the problem. We have to have some hearings to find out what is the actual issue. Talk to people like Delta Airlines and find out what they're experiencing. 
But I think one other question would be at the federal level is to talk about these ADA questions and is there some type of a certification, you know, is there more to just those two questions that needs to be asked or is there some type of certification that they can get that says this dog is ADA compliant? Well, that comes with it, a stamp of approval that makes it much more difficult for you to pass off Fluffy as your service dog. It's actually not a service dog, it's just your, your pet. So there's a lot of work to be done on this one, and there may be some things with ADA we need to review too, but that's our friends in Washington, D.C. Well, I think there'll be some pushback, though, because Americans and Minnesotans, I presume, love their pets. Marketresearch.com projects $96 billion in spending on pets by 2020. Don't people have a right, if their animals well behave, to bring them where they want to bring them? Perhaps, but it's also the right of the business not to have things happen. I mean, even the most well-behaved dog it can have accidents, can, it can become nervous and go beyond the training that it has. So I think there's a, great, there's a balance that can be struck. Um, the private property rights of the businesses or your own, individual, uh, your own individual rights need to be balanced. So we have a long discussion, I think, ahead of us as far as what we're going to do. One final question. An attorney for the National Disability Rights Network, which advocates on behalf of people with disabilities, argue that the laws, in essence, should aim to educate rather than punish. Do you agree? Uh, I think education would be a whole lot easier than creating the, the pet police running around to everybody's business or going to the airport. Uh, I, I really don't like having to go in that direction. Education is probably the f easiest and fastest one to do, uh, but I won't throw out anything as far as what, where we would go with this one. We need to identify the issue and find out really how bad it is. It's possible that maybe the issue isn't as bad as we think it is, but maybe with some education or maybe just the fact that we're talking about it will make some of these pet owners who are falsely or circumventing the process understand that you might not want to do that anymore with Fluffy. Senator Osmick, thanks so much. Thank you.